you're never going to be a good golfer. Welcome to the On The Edge podcast with your host, Scott Groves. All right, so your your mom and dad both end up here. They get set up. They get married. You guys, you guys have been here your whole life. Um, what's it like growing up in Vegas, man? It's really changed a lot. The Vegas I knew as a kid, it's not the same anymore. Obviously, the Strip is you know the thing that people think about when they come to Vegas. But I remember when I was like four or five years old, like most of Summerlin was not built. Right. Uh, you would you would drive up to you know let's say like Fort Apache Rampart. There's like nothing out there. So just the growth of the city is crazy. Otherwise. I really think it's the same as any other places minus, you know, the fact that it's super hot and there's no beach, but like the, the cousins I had in California, the cousins I had in New York, they would come here. They loved it here. I mean, I didn't think it was very much different than, you know, what everyone else says. I know some people say you can't raise kids here, but right. I don't believe in that at all. I think it's a great city. And I think now, especially it's become a multifaceted city. There's so many, there's so many things here that other cities had that we didn't have before more culture, more recreation, uh, more outdoor recreation too. I feel like they've really focused on making like walking paths, parks, uh, all that kind of stuff. So I loved growing up here. I had no problem with it. I didn't. I didn't look at people in other cities and be like, oh, I wish I grew up in California or I wish right. I grew up in New York or whatever else. Is it weird when you're like a teenage boy and there's like this huge party scene here and there's topless clubs and there's casinos? Like, is that in the back of your mind? Like, Definitely. I just can't wait to turn 21. Definitely. Or is it kind of like you just grow up with it? It just it's just part of what it is. There's like there's like a veil almost over it, and you're like, wow, I can't wait to pierce the veil. Like, see what's on the other side. Go to these clubs. Go to this. Go to that. Once you do it a few times, it's like, yeah, it's cool. It's I, I wasn't a, I wasn't a huge club person. Like I right. went a lot in college because, you know, what else are you gonna do? That's where everyone wanted to go. But uh, there was definitely this like anticipation always, especially. There's a really funny stereotype about Israeli guys. They love to club and party and stuff like that. So, <laughs> I did not so know about you, the stereotype. Yeah, it's they love. I mean, it's just like, in Israel, obviously, there's it's, it's not. I wouldn't say it's dangerous, but there are dangerous parts to Israel and the life over there. It's more, you know, it's more stressful. Let's say. So everyone, the life, they make life a party over there because you never know what's going to happen. And they right. carry that back to America when they move here. And Israelis love going to the nightclub. So I would always hear from, you know, going to synagogue, talking to the Israeli guys, seeing cousins or whatever. Oh, you can't wait to go to this nightclub, pure, this one, that. It's, so once I finally got to it, I was like, oh, this is fun. But uh, Israelis like clubbing more than I do for sure. There you go. <laughs> so you're, you're breaking the stereotype there. Um, and then, I, you know, I know one of the things that my wife and I were looking about, you know, when we were unhappy with the school system in L.A., then we were looking up here. We picked kind of a hybrid homeschool slash private school. It's the weirdest program ever. So we can be in L.A., yeah. we can be up here. It doesn't really matter. The kids can or cannot go to school, to, you know, depending on what we want. And then there's like a homeschool. Um, what was it like going to school up here? Cause I know notoriously the public schools here are not great. Yeah. So I probably wouldn't be the best person to ask about this because I went to private schools my whole life. My Perfect. parents knew that the public schools here were very suspect and, uh, more of what I heard from people once I went to UNLV of like how suspect, how suspect they were. I was happy that I actually did go to private schools. So I went to Jewish private schools until I was in eighth grade. And then I went to a school called the Meadows in Summerlin, yeah. which is a, it's a, it's a very good school. I mean, a really good education. Uh, every kid in my graduating class went to college. Like that's a big thing that they push there. So from what I've heard secondhand, the public schools are tough, but I really didn't experience it because I was very fortunate enough to be able to go to private schools. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I'm a pretty much like free market libertarian capitalist absolutionist. And I'm like, Oh, not surprising that Las Vegas of all places has some of the most amazing public or private schools. It's because the public schools kind of suck. And so the free market kind of steps in and yeah. does stuff. And there's, um, well, there's a reason it's because they don't charge. What was that, Chris? Sorry. <laughs> Man, we're just we're getting all messed up this podcast. We'll be fine. Just more proof that we film it in my garage. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah. So, I mean, when we started looking at private school options, there's just like a, a, a plethora of options, um, which is nice, but unfortunate for the kids in public school. And it's kind of like, well, there's no state taxes. The property That's taxes are really low. That's you get what, what you pay is. for. Yeah, exactly. The, the whole allure of coming here is that you can come here and live a great life with a nice house and you know your money goes farther but obviously it's because there's no taxes so if they raise the property tax if they if they enacted a state tax less people would come here and it would, it would impact the draw but obviously the caveat to that is your school suck so yeah. you got to really kind of pick and choose why you're coming here and what you you know what you really really want now if you have the money then you should definitely go to private school in my opinion because uh, the level the level in which I was at in college versus a lot of kids that I met in public school, not that they were dumb, God forbid, but just you could just tell that the basics, the foundation 
was so much stronger in the schools that I went to versus some of the schools that some of my friends went to. Yeah. I get this all the time from people. They're like, wait, you bought another house up in Vegas? Da, 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 da. And so we have to spend 181 days a year in Nevada so that there's no uh, income taxes. And they're like, well, does, does, they get all they get all worked up that I, that I partially left California. And they're like, well, don't you, um, you know, don't they still have homeless people and crime? And I'm like, yes, every big city has Everywhere. all those things. Literally. But- but they're not taking 15% of my money on yeah. income tax and property tax and whatnot to have those shitty problems so I can spend my money where I want. And um, yeah, it's just funny because this this keeps coming up, this like tax versus service. I'm like, well, you can live in LA where you pay all the taxes and you get none of the services. Yeah, and, the, and, the, and the public schools are still not that great. So um, yeah, I'm a big fan of keeping more of my money and then deciding where I want to spend it. Um, so tell me, you know, you went to UNLV, right? Yeah, I went to UNLV. So public college? I went to buy, yeah. What was the experience like there? Because you, for people that have not been to Vegas before, UNLV is like three blocks from the Strip. Yeah, it's literally um, right there. So it's, uh, I, I don't know how I would have ever focused if I turned 21 in college and went to UNLV. Yeah, so it was very interesting. So my first, I remember my first week at UNLV was overwhelming because my high school was only like 250 kids. So I would, I saw maybe 2,500 people walking to class my first day, right? To see that many people all together and like just, it, it felt like a, being a small fish in a big pond. I got used to it, obviously. I really appreciate it. It helped me grow up a lot. Uh, but having the strip in the background and having, like, the party city atmosphere, it definitely impacts it. Um, I, was, I was a part of a fraternity, a Jewish fraternity, and um, we would obviously do our house parties and things like that. But once you turn 21 or once you get a fake ID like everybody, right. you're going to the strip, right? There, there, was a, there was a time in which everybody that we knew was clubbing, and you would go to the club, like, three times a week. And they had, like, locals nights. And you would go like Monday night to Marquee. You would go Wednesday night to you know surrender at, at at Encore, and then you would go Sunday night to you know another a pool party or whatever. And you would do this for like you know one or two years, literally, until you got either tired of it oh. or until you know the girls would start working at the clubs, the guys would start working at the clubs. Uh, but it was it was very impactful on the social scene. Like everybody you knew that was of age or you know of age with an, a fake ID was definitely clubbing. So and yeah, if I was at the club and I know it gets cheaper when you're local and people yeah. hook you up and it's not, it's not like what people are thinking. If, if you don't live here and you come into town for a weekend and this is your Super Bowl and you want to do all the fancy stuff in a three day window, you're going to spend a shit ton of money. Yeah, literally. If you're local and you know somebody that works the club and you got a buddy who's a host and you can go on Thursday night instead of yeah. Friday night, it's surprisingly cost effective to party in Vegas if you don't gamble and you're local. Um, but there's no way I would have made it through college partying three nights a week. There's some kids that couldn't handle it. There's really some kids that couldn't handle it. And uh, the funny thing about the cost of it, it, obviously we didn't have the money, but we had the people. So if you could bring, let's say, like 10 girls, you know, you had, your, you had your, like six or seven buddies and you knew 10 girls that would come with you, they hook you up with free drinks, free entry, you know, free table or whatever it is. So that's how we got around it. We just, we just knew so many people of age that could make it happen. This, yeah, there's no chance I would have made it through college. I didn't make it through college as it was. I dropped out of Pasadena City College because I'm like, ah, I like working more. But if you if if I would have been in a school that had access to the level of partying and um, how will you say this attractive young ladies that you'll find in Vegas, and the uh, debauchery. I, yeah, and the debauchery, I would have never made it through. I would have been face down in a gutter. So thank you, mom and dad, for not moving here and sending me to UNLV. I would have been in big trouble. <laughs> Hey, this quick interruption is brought to you by me, Scott Groves, the host of the On The Edge podcast. This podcast is brought to you by me. Uh, I'm a loan officer who can help you with a mortgage in all 50 states across the United States. I also coach loan officers. So if you are a home buyer who's looking to get a mortgage, if you're a realtor who's looking to partner with an awesome loan officer, or if you're a loan officer looking for coaching, get in touch with me. It's those sources of revenue that allow us to produce this podcast and get out a new episode to you every week for the last couple of years. So if you're looking for a mortgage, if you're looking for a mortgage lender to partner with, or you're looking for a mortgage coach, I'm your guy. Now back to your regularly scheduled programming. What do you think um, like prepped you to work in that B2B and then also that B2C vertical? So I, I would say in college, I mean, being a fraternity guy, uh, I, I wouldn't say that my fraternity was the typical frat guy thing where it was like the pop collars and Sperry shoes or whatever. <laughs> uh, but the, the good thing about my fraternity, it was very business oriented, obviously, because we were Jewish and all the stereotypes. Uh, but they really actually pushed. Why that. is that such a stereotype, by the way? Because we, we love business. I, that's all we were allowed to do, let's say, four or five hundred years ago. We weren't allowed to be blacksmiths. We weren't allowed to be, you know, tradesmen or whatever. You were allowed to do lending. 
and you're allowed to do like entertainment type stuff. You know, that's, that's what was allowed for Jews in Europe and whatever else. So we just became really good at what we were allowed to do. And then the world became capitalist and right. that's what we were in, you know? Yeah. So can you explain this? Cause I think sometimes people hear that from either a Jew or yeah. especially a non-Jew and it sounds super offensive. Oh yeah. yeah they were only allowed to do money. People think about money today where right. it's like sexy to be a banker and being, yeah. oh, being a hedge fund manager. And Michael Douglas made it cool in the movie Wall Street to even be an evil movie. hedge fund yeah. manager. But like you said, five, 600 years ago, it was like almost sacrilege to work with money or be a lender. So can you explain historically as best you know how, um, how that stereotype comes about yeah, because it really was just a type back when it wasn't acceptable for people to work with money. There are certain religions, certain, uh, or I guess back in the certain religions, certain countries or whatever, were like charging interest was illegal. So if you couldn't charge interest, you had to find another group of people that could, right? So let's make the, you know, the Jews, like the the merchant of Venice, Shylock, right? It was yeah, like, make it, them the pariahs that have right. to work in the money field. Exactly, and you, you can like, you can make those people the devil, but it's like, you know, after a while, the, the whole world started basically moving towards, like I said, the capitalist society. So we were basically made to be almost like the scapegoats at the back, at back in the time where you were going to be the moneylender. Everyone hated those people. You know, they were the ones who were taking advantage of people with interest. And then after, like I said, after a while, it just became something that like we became so good at and became so needed that it obviously didn't have that stereotype anymore. But then it became, oh my God, now that they control the money, they control the world, which is again, a, <laughs> a crazy thing. So yeah, I, I've never understood. We spoke about this a little bit over yeah. our first media cigar. I've, I, I really truly in my heart of hearts, don't understand anti-Semitism because it's like, for the most part, you can't look at somebody and be like, oh, they they believe in the Jewish faith or they're a Jew. Like maybe there's some physical characteristics if you're like very ethnically Jewish, but it's like, I've just never, like I, I get it how people single out, you know, a, a, a culture or a race and they have clear details. Like if you're African-American, it's pretty easy to pick out of a crowd. I understand how that could be a thing where you could point to a group and make generalizations about them or have stereotypes about them or be prejudiced. But like the whole, these evil Jewish people, they run Hollywood, they run the yeah. bank. I just don't understand, one, the anti-Semitism, and two, like how it always just like rears its ugly head every pick a number, 25 years, 50 years. I don't get it because I don't belong to that yeah, I group. You. I don't belong to the affected group and I don't belong to the group that's affecting them. So can you, because it's still, it's very real, right? Anti-Semitism is very real. Oh, very uh, much so. uh, worldwide, even America. Can you explain what it is, where it comes from, or how you've experienced it? I, yeah, I don't even know what I'm asking. No, I just I, really don't get it. I hear what you mean. So in my opinion, the way that it works is, uh, if you look at just the foundation of religion, right? Just going back to the history, the Bible and whatever else, uh, they call it the Judeo, the Judeo-Christian kind of arm of it, right? Christians, Muslims, and Jews are all interconnected. If you think about it, you go all the way back up to, uh, in, in the Bible, in the Quran, and whatever, the New Testament. Uh, obviously, Jesus was a Jew. Right. right? And not even, even going farther back, they say Abraham's kids, Isaac and uh, Ishmael, right? Ishmael is kind of like the father. If you go down that tree, it go down, goes down to basically all Muslims. So Ishmael was cast out of Abraham's house. So there's beef right there. And then obviously, you know, there's a huge sentiment that people that feel as if that Jews betrayed Jesus. So that starts right there in the books, right? That's, it's, it's almost like gives you a reason when you, if you're any sort of religious person to almost dislike Jews in that respect. You could read that and be like, oh, those people don't sound good because they cast out Ishmael or they betray Jesus, right? You're not going to look at the people individually. You're going to look at the stereotype. And then continuing along history, right, you see this, you see it's a, we're a minority group. So it's easy to persecute against minorities, Right back in the day, you know, you you have you you have uh, a hate as a group, or there's you know bad economics, bad times, or whatever else. You take it out on somebody. A plague. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, it was because of them, or whatever. And then moving along history, right, with that sediment already in place, you put us in jobs that people dislike. You know, like oh, I owe that guy money. I, obviously, I'm not going to like that person that I owe money. Right. And also, Jews are very like they like to like to be in their little enclaves. Like assimilation with Jews back in the day was looked against. That's why we've been around for so long because we've really stayed in a tight knit group, right? We do business with each other. We try to marry each other. You know, we have our own language, our own, our own way of doing things. So when you're not assimilating with the other, with the other group, it's really easy just to look at those people and be like, they're not for us. They're only for them. Right. But Jews have always just been trying to get along. We don't, we're not, we don't, we're not against anybody. We're kind of just for us in, in a sense. Right. You know what I mean? So as time went on, like I was saying with the, uh, you know, with money lending, with getting into entertainment, things that we were allowed to do, we just excel that. So you take, 
you take those, you take those, you take those career, you take the history and the Bible and you put it all together and it, it, we just were looked at just down, right? You, you, you impacted our religion too. You impacted us economically too. Like this just, you guys seem like bad apples and it just pervades inside the society for people that generalize and just think we're bad. So, yeah. And it, it just, it, it sounds like the typical thing where humans can't dire- differentiate between correlation and causation. Yeah, literally. Like just, just because there's a bank doesn't mean the bank caused my problems. Like I put myself in debt and then maybe, you know, maybe the economy was suffering and then maybe I lost my house. It's not because Washington Mutual is a piece of shit and everybody that works there is a piece of shit. It's just like, no, I just kind of a bad set of circumstance, correlation, not causation. Sometimes the banks are the cause of it, but (laughs) but (laughs) not, not, not frequently. Um, Well, thank you for explaining that because I, I haven't heard it put like that succinctly, especially going back to the Bible. I guess that makes sense. What are you seeing in like the, the economics of Vegas real estate? So Vegas real estate, really interesting because uh, the inventory is again, very much down. It was, it was about triple what it was. It, it, let me, actually, let me backtrack. So last year, last summer, when rates- 2022. Are, yeah, 2022, when rates started going up, right? The mar- in the early 2022, it was just crazy on fire. Every house that was worth anything, 10, 20 offers, even the bad ones were getting, you know, a bunch of offers. Cause again, there was no inventory after- right you know, the lack of building over the 2010s. And then the rates rose and then the the inventory slowly rose from summer to winter 2022. So it kind of peaked in summer 2022. I think we had like 12,000 units on the market as last time I checked. And then slowly- Which by the way, uh, comparatively speaking, at the height of COVID where you couldn't get an offer except yeah. to save your life, how many properties were on the market like in Clark County? Like four or 5,000. Okay, cool. Yeah. So so more than double the inventory yeah, exactly. in 2022 because rates went up, things were moving slowly. Right. Everybody thought the economy was going to crash. Exactly, literally. So so obviously, usually the winter is a slower period. And then it was also the expectation that rates were going to keep rising and whatever else. So from December 2022 until now, the inventory has dropped like a crazy amount. I think it's back to like the four to 6,000 unit range or whatever else. Wow. Partially from some people taking their homes off the market because it was sitting for so long and they weren't getting the right offers, but also because now we're in the summer selling season, you know, kids are out of school, you can move. So because of that lack of inventory, the higher priced amounts, like let's say five, five fifty and above, there's still a hesitance with a lot of those houses because as you know, as a lender, the monthly payments for those can be, you know, four or $5,000. Yeah. So it's really hard to swing for the average couple, but the amounts that people are on average getting approved for are probably going to be, let's say, 450 and below. So if you're a house in the market right now, let's say if you have a pool, you're going to get 10 offers if you're below 450. It's just, it's bananas. If it's a cupcake house, like ready to go, not, not too much to change, and you're below 450, again, you're going to get 10, 12 offers. If the house has some things to repair, but it's not like anything crazy, again, a few offers, but uh, we're really just seeing like anything worth anything just flying off the market. Like there's a couple clients I'm working with now that we're looking in, in May. And they were kind of slow about moving towards things and they wanted to come back. And, and all the properties that they were looking at once June hit, which just flew off the market. So currently because of inventory and because now everyone has the expectation that rates are pretty much leveled off, uh, we're, gonna, we're seeing a summer selling boom compared to what it was six months ago. But compared to a year and a half ago, it's like nothing compared to that. Yeah. Well, a year and a half ago, I remember talking to a realtor and they're like, yeah, I haven't sold a house all year that wasn't to somebody who moved from out of state. Sorry, let me replay. Let me reset. No, I what you're saying, yeah. They, yeah, they, yeah, they had not sold a house to a Las Vegas local the entire year. Yeah. It was all people moving from, you know, uh, LA County, uh, Seattle, Portland, all the areas that were still yeah. locked down like two years later. They're like, screw this. I can be on a Southwest flight and come home Literally. to work in 45 minutes. I'll move to Vegas and take the tax advantage. Um, but I think a lot of that has slowed down. All those cities have opened back up again. Um, you know, people forgot why they were mad at the city to begin with. Um, yeah, but we, we used to say that, uh, we used to make the joke in 2021 that the the 2021 excuse, or, <clears throat> excuse me the 2021 Nevada Realtor of the Year was Gavin Newsom. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I like that. Yeah. A lot of people movie. I mean, cause it is so convenient. Like there's been a couple times where I had a realtor lunch, you know, we have four or five realtors going to go. I just drove to LA, had lunch and drove home and I was here to put the kids in bed. Like it's not great. It's like eight hours of driving in one day, but uh, that's why God created podcasts and, uh, audio books. And it was great. I just made a bunch of sales calls on the way down there, had a great lunch, got in the car, turned around, drove right back. Or, you know, we'll stay in our place down there if we can go down for a week or so. But it is, it is really convenient yeah. If you're an LA transplant to be in Vegas, like there's 100%. no, there's, there's no family that won't come visit you cause it's Vegas. You can be home really quick. Do you get hit up like all the time by friends that are like, Hey, can I come stay with you? Cause I want to come to Vegas. I mean, it's definitely sometimes a lot of them love to stay on the strip. I mean, everyone that yeah, comes, that's true. It's really, really, but 
a lot of times we get people that come that want to save the money and they'll stay with us. Uh, but uh, I like it when they stay on the strip because I get to experience that. I don't just go to the strip randomly just to go party or whatever. But uh, when they come here, it's always an excuse to go to the pool, to go to whatever else. I love it. Yeah. When you're local, at what age do you give up on the strip? Because I feel like everybody I know that's lived here for a while, they're like, yeah, I didn't. I avoid the strip like the plague. I feel like once I turned like 26, 27, I was just like, I don't want to deal with it anymore. Like driving, parking, walking, like dealing with it all. So yeah. like I said, unless we have family and I, I, we try not to go, um, unless there's like a specific event, like a sporting event or whatever else. I even took like a week of golfing lessons and even the golf instructor was like, not, not for you, bro. This is not for you. Take yeah. up, take up a racket sport. You have that kind of natural swing. You're never going to be a good golfer. That's why I love um, pickleball now. Cause I feel like pickleball is like the, you know, it's not like, it's not super hard. Pickleball is like the new CrossFit. Everybody's talking Everyone about pickleball. Does Everybody does. I don't, I, I mean, I know what it is. It's like, it's like ping pong, right? It's ping pong tennis. Ping pong tennis. Yeah. So it's a larger court, obviously. Right. But the idea. Larger than tennis? No, no, no. It's larger oh. than, obviously than ping pong. So oh, okay. Small, but I'm saying like the, when you play it, like you feel like. The ball itself, it's not a, it's not like a bouncy ball, but it, it has, it has a little bit of a, a bounce to it. And then the ra- the, 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 ra- the, what is it? the rackets are a little bit smaller and uh, the, the course itself, like you play two on two and the rules are a little bit different. It feels like you're playing ping pong with the rules because you have to let it bounce. There's certain places you can't go or whatever else. But uh, I feel like because tennis is like so much harder and then ping pong is like, so like just basic or whatever, it's that happy medium. Yeah. People feel like they can actually like become good at it after practicing. Whereas you could play golf for six months and not become better because it's it's it really is six that. years you could play know. golf and not feel like you know what the hell you're doing I, exactly with pickleball I feel like you play a few weeks you're gonna get to a level where you're not like amazing but you're not like you're not like that guy sucks you know yeah you can uh, you can hold your own exactly so I this is funny shout out to my buddy Josh Painter um, this is the craziest story my buddy Josh started playing pickleball like a year ago he loves it. And he has a house and a real estate uh, firm in uh, San Diego, but also in Temecula. Temecula is just like Vegas. You know, it's 100 something degrees during the summer. He and his partner just uh, signed the lease for an indoor pickleball facility. That's cool. They're going to have like five courts. They're going to have like a bar and a juice bar and sell equipment. And it's like, they're all in on pickleball. And I'm like, I won't, maybe we'll have them on and we'll talk some of the numbers. I won't divulge what the lease is going to be, but I'm like, dude, are you sure you're going to make money? Like what? And he's like, dude, he's it's like, so there hot. is an, there is an un like quenchable thirst yeah. for pickleball. And even if they build a court down the street, 18 courts outside, who wants to be outside when it's 101 degrees, they'll come to the air conditioned spot and play and have a juice and buy, you know, overpriced, uh, smoothies or something. It's I'm such like, a smart idea. Cause the courts here, I mean, once you get to like this time, you can only play until like 12 and, or 11. It's like ridiculous to be outside. So there's obviously a long way to the good courts. Like, uh, there's courts on Charleston and 215 that get really, really busy in the morning. So you got to, I think like that, I think would, would kill it. Uh, Chris, you need to start looking for some commercial warehousing space. Yeah. What, what does it cost in Vegas for a commercial warehouse space? Gershon and I are going to buy, uh, start a pickleball indoor league. But it's crazy because I was busting his balls. I'm like, this is the dumbest idea I've ever heard. So now he's texting me all the wins. He's like, we just had somebody want to pay us $5,000 to host a private tournament because they just want to bring in like a bunch of corporate people and like have a pickleball yeah. tournament, but they need the place all day. And I'm like, $5,000 for like wiffle ball? He's like, it's pickleball, dude. There's it's a not professional, wiffle ball. Pi- there's like a professional pickleball league. Shut up. Yeah, I'm pretty sure like some celebrities are, are the ones who, who are the commissioner or bought it, but there's literally a professional pickleball league now. I don't I don't know why this surprises me because there's a professional cornhole league, yeah. but all this stuff just seems funny. Like um, Chris's older brother, uh, Rob, who's a lifetime friend of mine, he's like on like a cornhole team and they have jerseys and they're trying to like work their way into like an ESPN rotation. I'm like, Dude, you're throwing bean bags. This is like it's a the bar ultimate game. Bro sport. Super bro sport. And and by the way, shout out to my buddy Rob. He is the ultimate bro. He's a fireman. He has the lifted yeah. truck, the RV, the sand rail. He's he fits all the stereotypes. Mm-hmm.